So I'm here to talk about the safety charter and critical risks. I've done a number of talks recently and I know a number of you have been to a lot of talks about the new bill. So I'm not going to go through the bill in detail, but what I'm going to do is isolate, probably not the word to use, but isolate the issues which deal with critical risk. And in doing that I'm going to talk about the charter because that's obviously very important in Canterbury. So. The Charter has a vision, it's about leadership, and I think that's the one thing under the new bill that I see as being vital, that is leadership and changing the culture in any industry. It's also talking about working together, and something Duncan said I think is very important, there's a lot of competitors in this room, and sure you can be competitors on price and tenders, but when it comes to health and safety, working together I think is one of the best uh, approaches you can take. And it's all of course about safety and providing for a safe work environment in Canterbury. So what the Charter does is it sets out uh, a number of commitments, there are 10 of them, and a number of actions, and again there are 10 actions. In terms of the commitments, the, the third one is the vital one for what we're talking about today, and it talks about all critical risk activities being identified, managed, and mitigated. Um, hazard identification in health and safety under the current Act, and especially under the new Bill, is vital. In terms of critical risks, though, they must be managed. I'm just querying whether mitigation is the right word there. I suspect it should be isolated. Uh, sorry, well, eliminated. So all critical risk activities must be identified, they must be managed and eliminated, but if not, then of course mitigated. And then the other, the charter um, actions, and there are, there are 10 actions, but there are two here that we need to look at, and the first is critical risk, uh, and it defines critical risk in the safety charter. And then we look at site safety risks. So I just want to have a little look at that. Before I do, though, we're going to look at some of the posters as we go through. And, um, these are very good posters which are used, and I think, in toilets and everywhere else. But this is the first one I, I've discovered working at height. And I think Dave Ballot from WorkSafe will, will probably talk a little bit about this. But working from height is one of the big uh, areas that WorkSafe have been targeting uh, over recent times. And I know in my experience, uh, you know, we've had a lot of uh, health and safety issues come up in the last year or so, and you know, there's been at least four act, well, incidents involving working at sites. And I'll just give you some examples of what we've seen. So the first was a builder who hired someone from a temporary company. The person from the temp company hadn't done building work for a while, was working in a residential house, walking on, the, on a ceiling, and fell through and was badly injured. Now, in that situation, the, the issue was again height because of where the person fell from and, and what practicable steps they could have taken to prevent that. The second one involved a, um, <coughs> a meatworks where an employee was walking around a yard on a raised platform and he fell into the yard and was badly injured. And, and the issue there was why did he fall into the yard? And again, the question was what practical steps could the company have taken to ensure he didn't fall into the yard? The third one is, is a welder who's working on heights, probably an area he should not have been working, um, didn't, had a safety harness on but wasn't connected and again he fell from a height uh, and was badly injured. And the last was a builder working on a residential home um, on the roof who again fell from a height and was badly injured. Now that's just the experience I've had in the last year or so of matters which WorkSafe have been looking at. So working from height is one of those really uh, important areas at the moment and I think in the building industry is an area where I think everybody needs to be aware. <coughs> so if we look at critical risks under the safety charter, your first obligation obviously is to identify. Now under the current act you're identifying significant hazards, um, under the charter you're identifying and managing critical risk work. And I think this is one of the big changes we're going to see from the Act through to the Bill. Um, you, at, at the moment we look at significant hazards and the identification, elimination, isolation and minimisation. Under the Bill we're moving more to this risk approach in terms of um, you know, looking at critical risk issues. And of course that is part of the commitment here under the Charter. So it sets out there a number of policies and procedures in terms of the activities they're consumed with. So we've talked about working at heights, uh, confined spaces is another one. Um, electricity, I do a lot of work in the electricity industry and I know there is a lot of issues at the moment in terms of 
uh, electrical underground electrical lines specifically, and even overground electrical lines being being uh, dug up um, as a result of the work being undertaken. So that's a big area. Asbestos is another area. We're doing a lot of, or well, we've seen a lot of uh, prosecution activity involving asbestos, both in the residential and in the commercial area. And it's a very difficult one, asbestos, obviously, because of the nature of the, the actual substance and, and how it may affect you. Um, excavations. Mobile plants an interesting one because what I see in the bill is a huge change from the emphasis under the current Act through to, to plant. And there are a huge number of sections under the, the bill dealing with plant, from the design of plant all the way through to you know, the installation of plant and everything in between. And the thing about plant, if you actually read um, uh, Moby's uh, document about a plant, plant can be anything from a photocopier in your office through to some of the more sophisticated and larger pieces of machinery. So be very careful when you're considering what plant is. Um, a lift is, is likely to be considered plant in a building such as this. Then you've got hot works, obviously, and workplace violence. And I think workplace violence can be not just the physical actions of one co-worker being annoyed with another and giving him a good hit, but you could probably look at issues such <clears throat> as bullying and harassment, which is more of a mental element of violence, um, and that brings you back to drug and alcohol as well, the impact of that in the workplace. So I think those critical risks are all uh, very important to consider. We go through to the next poster. So mobile plant can kill, and it's a critical risk. And again, you know, if, if you look at the new bill, it, it starts with the designer of the plant. It goes through to, to the manufacturer of the plant, and it looks at who constructs and installs and so on. And you know, I had a case recently where a company had designed and manufactured the piece of plant in Christchurch. It was sold some years ago to a North Island firm, and then a person was injured in that plant. And WorkSafe were rightly looking at my client, saying, well, okay, you designed this, and you, you then sold it. Um, you know, where is your design um, you know, manual? What have you done about health and safety within that manual? Uh, if you're involved in uh, installing plant or even uh, bring it into New Zealand, again, you've got to be careful about the type of plant you're using and that it has the safety requirements around it. So if we look now at the site safety risks, uh, there's a real emphasis here under the Charter to ensure that you have safety plans, and that includes traffic management plans, environment plans. And I think the issue here is one of evidence. One of the things I find when I'm looking at a potential prosecution or I'm going to an interview under caution with WorkSafe is I say to my clients, well, where is the evidence? You, know, you say you're doing this, but what is confirming what you've done? Um, where is it and what can I present to WorkSafe? So that they can be assured that you've actually done what you've said you're going to do. And so there's a number of things I've set out here in terms of each site. Um, a hazard register, I mean, everybody should have one, that's obvious. It's about what's put in there, though, um, you know, because that becomes evidence if things go wrong. Um, I like to think that hazard registers should be controlled by one person within an organisation, perhaps at each site if you've got more than one site, and that they're particularly trained as to what to write in there. We look at uh, current training and competency registers. Now, that's vital because when you have somebody on site who's not trained, uh, you know, that is one issue that currently, and I think under the bill, WorkSafe are going to be looking at you and saying, well, why weren't they trained? In one situation, I had a client who brought someone from overseas here, and we didn't have to just look at where the training was currently or, or in New Zealand for this person, but what training do they have overseas? And that can often be difficult if the person comes from a country where training is not important. Luckily, this person came from a country where training was pretty high. But again, you've got to have that evidence. Um, job safety analysis and task analysis. And I often find this is missing when somebody comes to me. You know, They might do it to begin with in, in a job as a whole, but that person could be moved to another site or a different job, and they don't have that job analysis or task analysis. And, and the problem with this, I suspect, is that it's becoming quite administratively difficult for you when somebody is doing more than one job on any one site. But they have to be trained on it, and there have to be a task analysis on each of those elements of the job. Uh, notifiable works is obvious. Tool, toolbox attendance register. Um, yeah, we, we use this all the time when I'm talking to the guys at WorkSafe and saying, well, there was a toolbox meeting, but was the person there, the person who was injured? 
Yeah, and, and how often do you actually put in attendance to say, yes, that person was there? So again, administratively difficult, but something I think that's really important. Um, permits to work, evidence of emergency management plans, and you know, securing boundaries and points of entry. That last one I think will become important under the new Act because there is a provision about those people who manage and control a workplace, which is about the entry and exit of the workplace as well as things arising out of it. And, and you look around Christchurch, a number of building sites and, and um, roadworks going on, the ability to <coughs> control entry and exit is, is actually vital, but, but of course very difficult. Um, we go on to talk about the use of contractors, and there's a great guide there that uh, Moby have put out. Um, it's very important when using contractors to actually do your due diligence on that contractor. <clears throat> Under the new Act, a worker is defined as an employee, a contractor, a subcontractor, and their employees. But if you're going to bring a contractor in to do work for you, or even a subcontractor, you've got to do due diligence. It's not simply about who's the cheapest or who's available, it's actually who has the experience to do this, who, who is qualified to do this. And there's a great example of a case down south where uh, New Zealand Rail brought in a contractor to, to fix a bridge. That contractor brought in a subcontractor to build a platform so that they could then fix the bridge. The platform collapsed and the um, machinery on the platform, the crane, fell over as well. Now, luckily no one was injured, but WorkSafe prosecuted. Um, and, and not so much New Zealand Rail, but it was the contractor and the subcontractor. Now, the subcontractor pleaded guilty because they built a platform that didn't work, so it was pretty obvious. But the contractor pleaded not guilty and said, well, we did our due diligence, we relied upon a subcontractor, we, we can't build platforms, these guys can, and yet it failed. And it went to the High Court and it was successful, and what the judge said there I think is really important contractor doesn't have to be a reinsurer of a subcontractor. And what that means is the contractor doesn't have to, you know, ensure that the subcontractor, you know, is doing everything right. They have to do their due diligence to ensure that the subcontractor is the right organisation to do that. I think that's um, a, a very good point because if you can't do something and you're contracting somebody in to do it, then you can only go so far to ensure that person is doing it right. And it's about due diligence, ensuring that you get the right organisation in to do the job that you want to be done. Uh, and then lastly, ensure all sites are isolated appropriately to reduce risk. And another one of the slides which are there. Th this is something which I think is become, and I'm seeing this as in my work in the electricity industry all the time, there are numerous underground electrical lines and, and gas um, lines which are being dug up. And you know, from a commercial perspective, that can be very uh, costly for you because you may well be liable if you start digging things up and you haven't done things right. But from a safety perspective, I mean, it's quite critical. Um, underground power lines can be, as we all know, very dangerous. And depending on how it's dug up, it could cause significant risk and harm to somebody. Um, there are obviously underground electric maps you can get, they're online, and there are a number of uh, ways in which you can uh, assess that area that you're digging up. So it's something, again, I'm seeing a lot of, and we have to be very careful about that, I, th I think, especially with the rebuild as it goes on. So look, that's all I want to talk about in terms of the charter. I'm now going to relate that and bring it back into the legislation. And I think this is a, a very good uh, description of how, how the legislation is changing. On the left hand side is the employment or the, the Health and Safety and Employment Act and it deals with risk in two sections only and we note those two sections were actually amended after the original Act came in. The first one is duties of persons selling or supplying plant for the use in the place of work, that's section 18A5 and the second one is employees may refuse to do work which is likely to cause serious harm. So two relatively um, underutilised sections. We then go to the bill, and there's some 37 sections that deal with risk. So I think what that, I think, demonstrates very clearly is we're moving from this, um, this, this system of prevention of harm through to identification of risk. So it is very much a risk process that this new bill is going to look at. <coughs> And so what we're going to do is I'm going to go through not all 37 of them, but just some of the more uh, critical ones um, as we go through today. And so it is about critical risk. This new bill is about that, and that's the new system, I think, that we're going to look at. 
the safety charter says that they expect one to two people being killed each year in Canterbury as a result of the rebuild, and that there's going to be a significant number of other uh, harms resulting. Um, $80 million cost and 600,000 hours lost as a result of uh, you know, injuries in the workplace. So we can see how important critical risk is. So in terms of the bill, things have changed just recently. Firstly, it is heavily based on the Australian model law, which is a 2011 um, Act in Australia. It's a federal act. What we're starting to see from Australia now, and I think one of the speakers later on will be able to talk about this, is the cases are starting to come through the courts, so it's taken two or three years for them to get through. Um, there's an officer case which is just about to go through the courts, or is going through the courts at the moment, and a few others. So we're starting to see from Australia how the legislation in New Zealand will work. And, and one of the things we're finding is that the way the legislation in New Zealand has been drafted, it, it's heavily reliant on the Australian legislation. So we, we've copied over a number of sections uh, and we're following the way they've done it. The reason for that is that uh, our health and safety processes under the Health and Safety and Employment Act haven't worked. We, we've probably put a partial application of the whole theory behind health and safety in New Zealand into place, whereas the Australians and the English probably put, done it on a much better basis. So we're now going to that system. So it's based heavily on the Australian um, model. The select committee has just been appointed, so we know who's on the select committee. Um, they are due to report back by 31 March. Now, unless they're going to be incredibly um, quick in what they do, this thing's not going to come in on 1 April. We expect now probably the bill will be enacted around about the third quarter of next year, um, but that's just a guess at this stage. And it is a dramatic rewrite of health and safety law in New Zealand. I think the one thing to, to, to consider is that the, the maximum fine here, which we all know is $3 million, which is the same as the Australian maximum fine, um, is one of the highest, if not the highest, fines in New Zealand legislation. Uh, and so I think it shows the importance that the government is placing on this Act and the deterrence that we're going to find arising out of this Act. Um, so the penalties, I think, are going to bite, and we know they're in three stages, and they affect uh, both the body corporate, the officer, and individuals. The second thing, obviously, is officers. And so for those of you who are directors and CEOs, and perhaps some people in senior roles in the organisation who you know, make decisions about the whole or mainly or most of the organisation, you now have more obligations in terms of due diligence, and we'll look at that as we go through. The test from all practicable steps to reasonably practicable. Now, I was at a conference in Queenstown recently, and someone said to me, well, if you're going from all practical steps to reasonably practicable, isn't that a, a lesser test? And in some respects it might be, because all practical steps, I think, is very objective. It's very much absolutely everything. Whereas reasonably practical is probably a little bit more subjective. What is reasonable in the circumstances? So there's one aspect of this new law which I think will create a lot of debate as to what exactly is reasonable. And then lastly, the duty holders. We all know about the PCBUs, uh, the person controlling a business or undertaking, offices and so on. So I'm going to start with the purpose of the bill, because this deals with issues of risk. It's, it's about you know, a balanced framework to secure health and safety, and you've got to provide the highest level of health and safety, as opposed to the current Act, which is about the prevention of harm. And in some respects, the current Act might be seen as that ambulance at the bottom of the cliff, where this bill is more the fence at the top, because we're looking now at preventing the risk that's going to cause harm, rather than trying to prevent the harm that arises out of the risk. So it's kind of just a different way of looking at it, but it's, I think it's a much higher standard which is brought out by this purpose. And of course it's about eliminating and minimising, so the step of isolation has been taken away. Now I don't think it's gone completely, I suspect isolation will be brought into minimisation uh, in terms of your new standards when you identify has in the work what you have to do. So your starting point of course is to try and eliminate that hazard. I think that in many respects is going to be difficult in, in a lot of cases. How do you totally get rid of something as opposed to uh, minimising or isolating it? Clause 12 actually defines risk. So this is the first time. Uh, risk is not defined under the Health and Safety and Employment Act. So it's defined to mean the possibility that death 
injury or illness might occur when a person is exposed to a hazard. So uh, injury and illness is, is not defined under the Act. So, you know, that could be quite wide. I mean, what, what is an illness? If you catch a flu at work through the air conditioning system, is that an illness? Um, and is that something which I have been, um, you know, exposed to? Is it a hazard? Um, so you've got to start thinking, I think, a, a little bit more about, in terms of risk, a, a wider range of, of instances that will apply. So your duties here, um, as we talked about, are the elimination and minimisation of risks. Um, the, the safety charter talks about the duty to manage risks, and that's brought through into this uh, bill as well. So it's about managing risk. Um, if I look at an example, if you had uh, you know, a piece of machinery at work which was something that uh, was a risk, to eliminate is to take that piece of machinery out. I mean, to isolate that piece of machinery might be to put you know, somebody who's qualified to work it on there. Um, to minimise it might be to try and fix it. I mean, it's those sorts of uh, steps that you need to look at. In terms of the primary care, this is under Clause uh, 30. This is probably a little bit similar to your Section 6 at the moment under the Health and Safety and Employment Act. But the primary care applies to a PCBU um, to, to take so far as reasonably practical to look at not putting um, persons at risk. And so they, they do that by way of <coughs> providing and maintaining a work environment without risk to health and safety. And okay, that's a very high standard, again, that you have to comply with. Um, and and it, it looks at the provision of information, training, instruction and supervision. So this, I think, it, it is already important, but I think under the bill it's going to become more important. What information do you have in your organisation about the risk that's there? Um, what training is provided? And we talked about that before under the safety charter. It's vital to have the right training for people, but also you verify that training. Um, what instruction is given? Um, and, and there are a number of cases out there at the moment where you know, there's a lack of, of instruction provided to people on how to do a certain uh, piece of work which results in that person being injured. And again, supervision. So these are vital aspects in any workplace. And again, it's more administrative tasks upon you to ensure all these are done, but it's for good purpose. It's to ensure it's a safe work environment. And that's, this is your primary duty of care. I've just put in here some of the duties of officers. So we know officers uh, are going to be your directors, are going to be your CEO, and perhaps some other senior people in your organisation. And, and what this section here is going to do is it's going to put a due diligence on your officers. So they're going to have to do a whole lot of, uh, or undertake a whole lot of steps now into the future to ensure that they're providing a safe work environment. And this comes back to the issue of leadership. If you want a good culture within your organisation, it's got to be led from the top. Um, I also think, though, it's about what's happening at the, at the ground level as well. So, it really, leadership goes from the top all the way down to the ground because those guys who are actually out there working on the roads or working on the building site are going to be the guys who can identify risks perhaps better than some of your leaders. But in terms of leaders, they have to gain an understanding of the nature of the operations and the business we're undertaking. Now, I was at a talk recently where someone said when they go to a building site, this is a large company, they go to a building site, they don't go there and talk to the, the manager or the supervisor and walk around with them, they grab a chippy or a labourer and say, right, you take me around and tell me what's going on. And I think that gives you real insight as to what's going on, on there. You get an understanding of the nature of the operation and, and the business or the undertaking. You've got to ensure appropriate resources and processes are available. Um, and so this is going to be I think, you know, where your, your directors and your CEO are going to have to start allocating more resources, uh, you know, and that means money in some respects, to health and safety to ensure that you are actually looking after the people in the workplace. And you've got to have appropriate processes for receiving, considering information about the risks. So that uh, is going to be a whole new system within your organisation to ensure that that information from the ground has been fed back up. Um, I think the role of health and safety manager is going to become a lot more important in New Zealand, and, and I suspect in Australia it, it already is. 
Um, it's going to become a role which uh, I think really becomes part, if not part of the senior leadership team, is certainly reporting in there to say, look, this is what's happening out there. So you, you'll start, I suspect, seeing board uh, minutes and, and meetings uh, you know, starting or certainly spending some time on health and safety, not just on the money side of the business. In terms of Clause 43, this is, um, in terms of offences, this is the second tier. So the first tier is your $3 million uh, tier. This is the second tier where you fail to comply with the health and safety duty and that exposes an individual to risk. So again, risk is brought into the offence side of things. Here, um, the maximum fine, of course, is um, 1.5 million for the company, 300,000 for the officer, and 150,000 for the individual. That compares to a current fine of 250,000. So we're seeing a six-fold increase in the fines, effectively, in terms of the maximum fine. Um, be interesting to see how the courts look at this. Uh, you know. We think that the, fi the starting point a court might look at is, is going to be anything between five to six times the current starting point. So if, if you're in court and, and you have high culpability and you have um, a, a, a quite a significant injury, the court might say, well, our starting point is between X, X and Y. We now look at that, that maybe under the new bill being four to five, maybe six times higher than that. So it's going to mean there's some really some next significant fines coming out uh, under the new Act certainly when it comes into place. All right, so I've just referred to some cases here um, which deal with the issue of elimination, isolation, and so on. And I referred to the first case because I was junior counsel on that case, and it was really the first offended case in New Zealand under the old Act. I don't know if you remember it, Dave. It was a long time ago. I kind of remember it because it was one of my first cases. Um, in that case, uh, Judge Holdness was the judge. There was no law in New Zealand. I mean, we, we had to rely on English law, and, 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 and in that situation, an individual was in a wool uh, baling plant. There was a vertical uh, conveyor belt, which was bringing bales up and dropping them off. He decided to look down to see what was happening below him. A bar came down, and, and he was killed. And what the judge said then, in, in you know, as I say, quite groundbreaking case, was that you know, Parliament has deliberately placed on employers a positive duty to seek hazards in order to determine whether they are significant, which is the current Act, um, but to look to, to either eliminate, isolate or minimise. But importantly, he said, you know, what is important is that the Act casts a positive duty on uh, the company. And I think that's something that flows through in a lot of the cases since then. You know, that positive duty on the company, and especially under the new bill, where I think that positive duty picks up to you know, what the purpose talks about, the highest level of protection for employees. In that case there, there was a $6,500 fine for the death. It was appealed to the High Court, it went to 15000 Now, that was of course in 94, I think the High Court was probably 96, but um, 15000 then, you know, now that sort of fine would be significantly higher. The, the Transrail case, again, I think is a very good case. And you can see it's quite an old case, but it talks about the uncompromising and onerous obligations on employers. And that, again, they must be proactive. So this positive, proactive um, wording that the courts are using from the very early stages of the Act are going to flow through to the new bill, but even more so. And, and it talks about to anticipate harm and take all practical steps to minimise it. So in that case, elimination, isolation obviously wasn't appropriate. So again, it's about this positive, proactive approach that employers must take under the new bill. It's going to be even higher level of duty for you to be positive and proactive. And the last case is, is the Central Cranes case, where it said that as the level of risk increases, so does the extent that the employer steps to control that risk. So you've got to be very careful about looking at and identifying risk in the organisation and at what level it is, and then determining well, what controls they'll have to put in place. So, you know, eliminate. Can you remove risk, take it out of the workplace? As I say, in most cases, it's very difficult to do that. And there's an interesting decision there in 2008, so a little bit more recent, where the High Court said that there may be situations where the potential harm is so severe, for example, death, uh, that, and the risk is so high that the cost of avoiding the risk is too high, then the task should not be attempted at all. 
Um, so, there's, I mean, there's a great example at the moment of what Sarah and Southern Response are doing with some of the houses in, in Redcliffe. And there's a picture in the paper this morning. I don't know if you, anyone come in from Sumner, but there's a house on the lean with an orange roof. Wondered how on earth they're going to do that. They've got a remote control digger in there uh, destroying it, and it's pretty much gone. So, in that case, there, they're looking at the risk being so high. It's a house on the edge in a very bad state. We're not going to put somebody human in there, but we've found a way to deal with that. We've eliminated the risk by putting in a remote control digger. So it's a very good example of that. The Mighty Power River Power case, 2012, which is quite recent, talks about, and it's an employment relations authority case, not health and safety case, but it did talk about drug testing in the organisation. Um, and this is a very big issue at the moment. There's a lot of discussion about drug and alcohol testing in organisations, to what level do you go, to what sort of standard do you test. And in that case there, uh, it was deemed to be a safety sensitive area. And I suspect most people in here are working in safety sensitive areas. And, and that random drug testing was appropriate. Um, and it certainly relied on an old Air New Zealand decision about random drug testing. So in terms of drug testing and alcohol testing, um, th the law is this, and there's a, there's a very good health and safety case on this. People have to turn up to work substantially free of drugs and alcohol in their system. And what it means by substantially free is that there's possibly going to be drugs, or sorry, more likely alcohol in your system through cough medicine or hand wash or, 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 or the like. So you've got to be substantially free to a level where you're not unfit to work. So... Um, that, I think, is very important going forward in terms of how you draft your policies and how you look at drugs and alcohol in the system. And, of course, on the 1st of December, the alcohol limit in New Zealand comes down from 400 to 250, um, which is bringing New Zealand in line with the rest of the case for, for driving, uh, at least. So something you need to look at in your own system or your own policies is how do we look at drugs and alcohol. But what they said in that case was that random drug and alcohol testing is a step that an employer could reasonably take in the interest of elimination, isolation and minimisation of significant hazards in the workplace. And I think if we bring that through to uh, the new bill to eliminate risk, to identify and eliminate risk, again, drugs and alcohol testing I think is very important. So one thing we're seeing a lot of at the moment is, is this area where people are developing policies and implementing them. There's also some interesting um, testing analysis coming out. I don't know if people have seen it, but people are, the, some companies now are looking at going beyond breath and saliva and looking at hair analysis. So cutting a piece of hair off someone and testing them for drugs and alcohol. Maybe a little far because that probably goes back into your history a little bit more than you want it to go back. The other one is drug dogs. Um, great deterrence and very effective. So in terms of minimisation, um, can you reduce the risk? And that's what we're talking about with minimisation. The obvious ones are PPE uh, and training. And I think you add to that uh, supervision and, and instruction. So can you reduce the risk? And, and there's a great case there, the Ecolab case, where the, the, the judge said, and this is under the current Act, you've got to look at the highest level of control rather than relying on PPE to control the hazard. So it's not that you give your stuff protective clothing to control the hazard, you actually control the hazard and have protective clothing as a, as a backup. And that's effectively what that case was saying. Um, in the, uh, the, the Simic case, it talked about the human uh, nature factor because, of course, hazard under the current Act and under the new Act includes the behaviour of humans as being a very important hazard within any organisation. You know, whether that behaviour is one of bullying or harassment, or whether the person's effect affected by fatigue or drugs and alcohol. Um, and, and in that case there, there was a discussion about a cherry picker uh, and whether or not you know, the organisation should have had full body harness on the person using the cherry picker. And the last one is the South Pacific Meats case. I don't know if anyone's heard about this one, but it's a very interesting one. Uh, an employee turned up to work stoned off his head, and he admitted he was very, very high on drugs. He then went to do his job um, on, on basically a, a shank saw. He hadn't had the instructions on the day. He hadn't had the proper training nor the supervision. I think he piled up a number of different carcasses and tried to put them through at once because they were coming through quite quickly. He was injured and the company, um, and WorkSafe actually decided not to prosecute in that case, but a private prosecution went ahead and they were found to be liable. And you'll think, well, hang on, the guy turns up 
you know, stoned off his head, yet the company's liable. But the point there is not about the, the, the person, because in health and safety, you've got to look at the person in doing silly things, in being you know, under the influence of drugs and alcohol. You've got to ensure that your systems are in place to deal with that. You know, what was the drug and alcohol policy in that organisation? Who assessed them on the morning? Who was supervising to know he was stoned off his head? And then you go back to, but in any event, he wasn't trained properly on the actual system. He wasn't supervising, he didn't have instructions anyway. So the company is liable, despite the fact of the employee's you know, stoned uh, disposition at that time. So it comes back to that training and supervision again. In terms of the Australian experience, I won't spend a lot of time on this because I know you've got a, a speaker who's a lot more uh, qualified to talk about this than myself. But in Australia, their Clause 17, Management of Risk, which is similar to our Clause 22, which is Duty to Manage Risk. And again, it's, we've copied it over pretty closely about elimination, elimination and minimisation of uh, the risk. And again, in managing risk in Australia, um, this is something which they, they flesh out, you know, the, the actual elements of elimination and minimisation. And, you know, they talk here about administrative controls in Australia to try and minimise a risk. Um, and, and, you know, that includes PPE and other aspects such as training and supervision. So... I haven't seen a lot of case law coming out of Australia yet uh, on this duty to manage risk, but I'm sure it will come out, and that will be very, I think, instructive in New Zealand about how we look uh, as an organisation or companies in New Zealand to manage risk. 